Um, welcome to today's roundtable uh, entitled EU India Contemporary and Historical Perspectives. Uh, my name is David Traceman, I'm an adjunct researcher at the Monash Asia Institute and ch uh, chair for today's session. Um, well, today's roundtable and an upcoming book by the same title is a culmination of another successful collaboration between two of Monash University's uh, multidisciplinary research centres. Uh, the Monash European and EU Centre, which is a joint undertaking by the European Commission and Monash University, and is one of just 22 such centres worldwide. Uh, one of its primary objectives is the provision of top quality research on Europe and uh, EU on the international stage, and the other being the Monash Asia Institute, which is Monash University's Asian Research and Teaching Centre, and is committed to the excellence in multidisciplinary research, teaching, and publishing related to Asian studies. At the core of any research center is its staff, and today we have the benefit of two of the university's preeminent scholars. Uh, I should know, I have had the good fortune to work with both of them. Uh, Professor Pe Pascaline Vinan uh, is the Jean Monnet Chair in European Integration and International Relations. Uh, she has published widely on the EU, its external relations, and has taught in the EUI in Florence, ULB in Belgium, and is a visiting professor at the universities in Ukraine, Russia, Peru, and the USA. Our other speaker, Professor uh, Marika Vitiani, has published extensively on the intersection between mass poverty, minorities, and regional security in South Asia and China, with a particular focus on India. Uh, Marika is the chair of the Monash Asia series with Monash University Publishing and is an honorary professor in the Institute of Development Studies, Kolkata, and president of the South Asian Studies Association of Australia. So the format for today is that uh, each of our speakers uh, will give their presentation um, and then we'll follow that with a round of discussion. Uh, feedback is very much appreciated from everyone. Uh, Professor uh, Vinan will begin offering a historical perspective um, and will address the evolution of European Community India relations from 1950 to the 1980s. Uh, we'll follow this with uh, Professor Vicciani, who will offer a contemporary perspective outlining her research on EU India relations in terms of agriculture, industry, investment, and especially global security. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to offer a few of my own reflections on why the topic is significant. Uh, it comes at a time where the European Union and India are redefining uh, their places in the global arena. It also comes at a, a stage uh, in world events uh, that is undergoing severe economic turmoil. And both entities face the need to implement reforms in order to mitigate aggregate risks and restore economic growth. Europe, I'm sure you're all well aware of, uh, is facing a considerable challenge in deleveraging its banks. And India, uh, with uh, notable uh, cases of uh, infrastructure bottlenecks and rising costs of business that is leading to uh, slowing in uh, growth and investment. Yet both entities uh, have a preference for mutual cooperation. India has been named as the EU strategic partner, and an FDA between the EU and India is hoped to be concluded by the end of this year. This will have a direct impact on the lives of their combined 1.7 billion citizens, uh, which is roughly a quarter of the world's population. As such, understanding the evolution of EU-India relations and the contemporary perceptions of future costs and benefits in terms of agriculture, industry, investment, and global security is fundamental in understanding the prospects for future cooperation between the European Union and India. So, with all that said, I'll hand over to Pascaline. Thank you. Thank you for these kind words. I hope we, we deserve them. I'm not sure. As uh, I told some of you, some of my students are here today. Um, this is still work in progress, but we've made uh, a lot of work and we've made a lot of progress so far. So I hope um, what we present today reflects that. 
Um, I would like also to thank Emma over there who has transcribed some of the interviews for, for us, uh, which we're still exploiting in, uh, in our work. So what I'm going to do today is to tell you a story. I will not get to the end of the story, however, that's impossible. I uh, have about 30 minutes, I think, and I will try not to go beyond that. So um, I uh, will start with a quotation. The Indian government has so far maintained a reserved, in certain cases, frankly hostile attitude towards the treaty instituting the European common market. So these words were written in 1958, when uh, two new European communities had just joined, you know, the first one, the European Coal and Steel Community, so you have now three, the EEC, uh, Euratom, and the European Coal and Steel uh, Communities. So there was a lot of concern uh, in India about uh, the, the common market, but if we go back a little bit uh, in time, just after the Second World War, we see that the Indian elite, um, at least part of the Indian elite, was fascinated by regional organizations. And so if you look, for example, at the publications of the Indian Council of World Affairs, a prominent think tank in New Delhi, with close ties to uh, Indian officials, you find uh, a lot of publications uh, about regional organizations. And uh, you have uh, scholars, uh, journalists, uh, uh, Indian officials, few, uh, there's a future uh, Indian uh, ambassador in France, for instance, who um, talk about these richer organization and about the possibility uh, of having, uh, for example, a European Union. But they also say, well, it doesn't look very likely right now, quite frankly, because uh, what you would need in such a union is France and Germany, and they'd have to get along, so that's impossible. You would also need the British, but that's not going to work, because of course they have all these times with the Commonwealth, so it's never going to work. Uh, and uh, if there was unification, maybe it would be dominated by Germany. And we know what there's been an attempt already just during the war to unify Europe uh, uh, you know, um, with Germany um, uh, at uh, the helm of, uh, of Europe, basically. So there were all these concerns, but still a lot of interest uh, in regional organizations. Um, and uh, some of the, if you look at the publications in the India Quarterly, which was being put out by this uh, Indian Council of World Affairs, uh, you find also that uh, the, the authors uh, of these articles look to other regions, like Latin America, for example, uh, where, uh, for example, you have the Organization of American States. They, they look at these organizations to think uh, what they could actually do uh, in, uh, in Asia as well. And they think that it could be advantageous to have rich organizations uh, in Asia to, uh, for instance, get more foreign aid. I'm simplifying, there's a lot of details in these articles. Uh, but also to uh, resolve um, conflicts uh, in the region. So a lot of interest. And at the same time, if we move toward the, the 50s, uh, a lot of uh, concern. So even before the uh, European Coal and Steel community or the EEC uh, saw the light of the day, you have Indian reactions to this, this project, but particularly when uh, the uh, EEC uh, is being negotiated. And um, at the same time uh, as the uh, European Economic Community is being negotiated, there's also a project for a uh, huge free trade area in industrial products that's being proposed by the British as a reaction, uh, if you will, to the, the proposal for a uh, uh, European Economic uh, Community. And um, I can't go into the reactions to the free trade area that would take too long, but uh, on the EC, um, some of the reactions were that uh, Indian cotton textiles, that's a big dossier in the whole relationship, might be uh, displaced by EC producers selling to, e to other EC producers. A second concern uh, was uh, that also uh, you would have uh, the uh, association of um, you know, overseas territories, European overseas territories, uh, to the EC, and that would have uh, a negative impact uh, on um, Indian interests. So particularly, uh, the Indians were very concerned about the preferential treatment that would be given to uh, French, uh, French colonies. And uh, not only were they worried for their uh, exports, but also for uh, the investment that would, fall, uh, that would uh, flow to India. Because 
those uh, colonies, you know, or ex-colonies that were going to be associated with uh, DEC would also benefit from a special investment fund, you see? And so that meant that if these colonies uh, benefited, or ex-colonies benefited from this special investment fund, India, less investment would pro probably fall, uh, um, to, would probably go to India. So India would be placed at a disadvantage. So these are early reactions to, uh, to, the, uh, to the EEC. And so um, what uh, the uh, Indian Foreign Ministry uh, does is uh, to send an end memoir to the ambassadors you know, of the six community countries. I don't know if you are familiar with the EEC, but at the time there were just six countries. So there was France, uh, Germany, the Benelux countries, and then Italy. And so uh, this end memoir is being sent to the ambassadors of these six countries, and it expresses all these Indian concerns. And um, the reply that they get uh, is pretty uh, interesting and very high-handed. Um, and the, the reply is also sent, actually, to, uh, to the British, just to make sure that this is the right you know, uh, answer to, to give to, uh, uh, to, to the Indians. And it's drafted by the Belgians. So the Belgians give in confidence you know, this, uh, this uh, reply, the draft reply to the British uh, government. And this is what... Uh, what, what they say. And then uh, after that, you know, actually this draft was used by uh, all the other member states to send similar replies you know, to, uh, to, to this India. So, so what the Belgian government said uh, is that, um, you know, it was a great idea, you know, to extend uh, preferences to uh, associated uh, uh, EC overseas uh, territories. It was a, a generous effort uh, and that uh, uh, the Belgian government did not understand why India, uh, which was you know leading you know developing countries, could not understand, could not view with sympathy, quote an effort as vast, practical, and disinterested as the association of overseas territories with the EC. And the Belgian government declared itself quote deeply conscious of its obligations to the people of the Congo and was firmly resolved. Uh, as were its partners to pursue the development of the African peoples with the view to bringing them to the full development of their moral, material, and political strength and putting them in a way to bring to humanity the benefit of their cooperation in peace, civilization, and progress. <laughs> you see, it's a, the, the kind of reply you would get uh, at the time. So, of course, this high-handed defense of the intentions of the six did not come uh, Indian uh, uh, apprehensions. And uh, the Indian Prime Minister told the Japanese correspondent in New Delhi, I do not approve of the common market scheme in Europe, a scheme in Europe. I am afraid that the scheme will mean exploitation of colonies of European uh, countries. So obviously, you know, this uh, answer did not, uh, did not really, really work. So what we find over time is um, that uh, India tries to uh, try several strategies to deal with the EC. And one of the first strategy, uh, of course, no, the first one is to uh, directly tell the six what, what they think, but uh, another strategy is to try to control uh, the EC within the GATT. And um, to say, uh, but I were not the only one to say that, that actually the association of overseas territories with the EC is not compatible uh, with the GATT. And there is a, an article in the GATT that talks about you know, a free trade association and customs union. And so, so that's the first strategy. It does not work. And in the end, uh, what uh, the, the GATT agrees is that it's best to negotiate with India and other countries that would be affected by the association uh, to concrete measures that might alleviate the consequences of the creation of the EC. So there are negotiations of all kinds of different commodities like tea, tobacco, and so on and so on. Um, and then out comes the times of missions. So there are a lot of missions by business people, uh, Indian officials, uh, that uh, go to some of the key countries in the EU, some of the largest countries, but also to Belgium, also to the smaller ones, because there is a great diamond trade so it's in Belgium. Uh, uh, so <laughs> so that's, uh, that you'd have to read, I guess, in, uh, in the book. And uh, they try to see how you could uh, improve you know, exports to various countries. Because there are a lot of imports from Germany, for example, 
but it's not uh, balanced. And so it's the time of the negotiation of bilateral agreements with all of these uh, different uh, uh, countries. Um, so bilateral agreements, and it's also the time where India starts thinking that they need a representation right in Brussels. Uh, so they begin to think that maybe we should have a, an Indian mission to the EEC to best uh, represent uh, Indian, uh, Indian interests. Um, also, by consulting you know, with the Europeans, uh, the uh, Indian businessmen and officials became more aware of the frustration of some uh, Europeans in dealing uh, with India, and um, they start to remedy some of the problems. So they, some of them are very critical of the government for bureaucratic uh, sluggishness, so that's you know, some Indian officials having gone to Europe and heard the complaints of some businessmen. Uh, they also think that you should uh, decentralize the Indian government uh, further, uh, that there should be also more publicity, more marketing, so efforts have to be made also to improve the Indian side of the nation. Uh, <coughs> so bilateral contacts have been tried, the GATT has been tried, the direct representation to the EC, and then there was also the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth offered a convenient uh, framework to vent Indian frustrations you know, with the common market, but also with the European Free Trade Association, which had just been created in 1960. And uh, the Indians were particularly afraid of one thing, is that the EFTA and the EEC would collaborate with one another. That was you know, a big no-no, because it would be really to the, to the disadvantage of uh, Indian uh, exporters. Hi, <coughs> Julie. Um, and um, so they thought that the way to try to remedy this would be to go to the GATT, you know, and to know, try to remedy this in the GATT. So again, the GATT comes up, you know, as a, the solution to everything. And it's very fitting that uh, Jajit has just become who's an expert on the GATT and the WTO, so we're just talking about that. Um, and uh, so in the end, India met with limited success in negotiation with the uh, EC uh, in uh, the GATT. Um, and the EC uh, uh, basically said, we're only required to propose compensation to India, where the uh, EC common external tariff will lead to a higher tariff than the original tariffs of the member states. And that's it. And so what, what India said, well, that's okay, but there are certain products that are vital to our economy, and you're not making any offers on that. So this is not very good, is it? And again, there were problems with cotton products and so on, but that would take me another hour to explain the whole thing, so I, I cannot do this now. And uh, increasingly, uh, India brought attention to the fact that it had a huge trade deficit and that need, this needed to be addressed. Um, and uh, if you look at the, what the Indian Chamber of Commerce in Calcutta, for example, had to say about this, well, the chamber argued that in the past, trade deficits had not mattered much as India could draw on its sterling balances and benefit from loans and credits from the USA and other various donors. But sterling balances were now very, very low, and loans and credits could only get you so far. So what was needed was a substantial increase in Indian exports to earn sufficient foreign exchange to meet the requirements of India's plans for development. Uh, so we find this already in the 60s, you know, in the literature you find a lot about you know, the fact that this all started in the 90s and then all of a sudden uh, India um, thinks that you need, you know, to step up import and um, exports, you know, to uh, be able to uh, sustain uh, uh, the development of its economy. But of course it's a completely different degree in the 1990s, but already in the 60s you find this. And it's like a mantra, it keeps being repeated time and time that we need to increase our export, we need to increase our export, you need to help us to increase our export. Um, and uh, so there was a negative balance of trade with the EC as a whole, but Germany was a particular concern. Uh, because uh, India imported a lot of machinery, plant and industrial equipment uh, from Germany, but it could not export as much. And so there was this huge imbalance uh, here. Um, also, this is the time where India thinks that it has to diversify the range of uh, its, uh, its exports, um, and that perhaps the EC is going to grow, you know, the, the standard of living of its population is uh, going to go up further, and therefore, if you manage to diversify also what you're exporting to this area, this will be great profits to India in the end. 
And then what happens? Well, the British are trying to join the common market. And then the reaction completely changes. <laughs> and uh, if you read, uh, if you do, but there are reactions in the official and private circles. I'll just give you a few here. So um, there was a virulent opposition. That's what being, that's what's being reported by the councillor of the EC member states in New Delhi, with all the different embassies. So they report that there was an entire virulent opposition against the project uh, of associating the United Kingdom to the common market and the Federation. Uh, of uh, Indian uh, Chambers of Commerce and Industry led a violent campaign against this association. So you see a big change of a, of a situation here. And um, what were the fears here? Why such a virulent uh, reaction? Um, well, the governmental uh, circles feared that the association would undermine the unity of the Commonwealth and that African countries would now be the main beneficiaries of aid from Western Europe. And Prime Minister Nehru felt that the latter could lead to a real political control of underdeveloped countries. So you get reactions at the higher level, which uh, are uh, pretty, pretty negative. Um, and um, so the, the British come to India to try to explain what they are trying to do. And I won't give all the names here, people will come to, to India. Uh, but uh, they get reactions from Nehru, for example, uh, like, uh, um, so is the United Kingdom uh, going to gain any influence by being a member of the six? Uh, and the fear here is that the United Kingdom is not going to gain influence. And who is then going to gain influence in the Commonwealth? Well, maybe the United States will replace the UK, you know, as a, as a leader. And for, for India, the Commonwealth is very important uh, to vent its views and so on. So th there seems to be this, uh, this fear that the UK will be less influence, uh, influential and that the US will, uh, will replace it. Uh, there's also a fear that the Commonwealth will be split in a way, because there'll be some members of the Commonwealth that will join the EC or that will be associated with the EC, and the others that will not. So it will have a weaker Commonwealth, and so that's not good uh, for, uh, for India. And so what happens is uh, uh, an incredible lobbying campaign on the part of, uh, of India to try to make sure that if the UK joins, uh, its interests uh, are uh, protected. I'll, I'll, be, I'll keep to time, Eric, I'll try anyway. And so uh, there is this, um, the Indian mission uh, finally opens uh, in Brussels in November 1961. And there is a, a character that's very important to our story here, um, Ambassador Lal, so L-A-L-L, who is a, a brilliant uh, a diplomat who then comes to defend uh, Indian interests uh, in, uh, during the, the British negotiations. So he's there to defend uh, Indian interests towards the EC and um, to make sure that uh, Indian views are being heeded during the negotiation for British entry into the common market. Well, Lal is very interested uh, in uh, regional uh, co cooperation and he's been promoting this cooperation among the countries of the UN Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East. And he writes a report uh, for that uh, organization uh, together with experts from Thailand uh, and, uh, and Japan where he looks at what's being achieved uh, in, uh, in Europe and says that, for instance, the European Coal and Steel Community is one of the decisive steps in regional coordination. Uh, so he looks and, uh, at these developments in Europe and also says that Asia must increase uh, its production and export uh, surpluses uh, and develop its capacity to pay for its exports and also to serve its much needed credits through increasing the volume, diversifying the range and improving the quality and value of its exports. And he says the GAL has not so far yielded uh, you know, a satisfactory solution. So what we need to do is to try to get our acts together in Asia and uh, have an organization for Asian economic uh, uh, cooperation. So that's just to present the person who is being sent to, uh, to Brussels. And so what happens in Brussels is that Lyle gets very, very active and writes this incredibly long memo. I don't know, I don't know how many pages, but 19 pages of memo. It's been sent to the European Commission, to the European Council, to the member states, and so on. 
and it details, you know, the entire Indian situation. It's very interesting to read it. It's very, but I can't go into all the details here. And uh, it says, okay, the UK is very, very important for our exports. And you, EC, well, you're not so important for our exports yet, anyway. Huh? So, uh, in terms of the uh, diversity of exports, um, the UK is a much more interesting market for us. Um, and, uh, for instance, uh, it's also in the terms of the, the volume of export, it's also much more important than the EC. So we start to lose a lot uh, if the UK joins the common market and we don't uh, have any transition period uh, uh, which can be used to adapt to the common external tariff that would be uh, applied to us when the UK joins and um, also um, also, what, uh, what uh, Lal also says, again, he brings the attention to the fact that there's a huge trade deficit uh, with the community, and he wants to know the numbers. They keep being repeated from, uh, from memo to memo, in fact, all these, uh, all these numbers. Um, and he tries to explain why there is this uh, huge deficit, and uh, he blames the EC for its high tariffs, its internal taxes, and huge quota uh, restrictions that are being imposed on products that are very important uh, to, uh, to India. And so, uh, in the conclusion of this very, very long memo, he asked for a transition to allow India to adjust to the effect of British membership on India's uh, trade. Okay, so that's a very long memo, very hard to digest. I can imagine people receiving this long memo and saying, oh no, what is the... You know, how can we make sense of this? Uh, so anyway, hard to digest, certainly. Um, but uh, Lan found some sympathy in the European Commission, and it seems that over time, a kind of friendship uh, developed between uh, some Indian officials and also some people in the Commission. And that's what I found out. It's all really interesting in some of the, uh, of the documents. So um, the Commission, the European Commission, has some sympathy. Uh, for uh, Indian views um, and uh, tries then to defend these views vis-a-vis -vis the member states and also uh, some powerful lobbies, as particularly on textiles. So good luck with that, it's not very easy. At the same time, uh, what uh, India does is to speak to the British and say, look, you have to push for you know, uh, our case, you have to help us. And so the British try to do a number of things. First of all, they think, well, maybe India could get also associated overseas territory status, like all the other, you know, Commonwealth countries from Africa, for instance. Maybe we could try to negotiate for that. But they quickly abandon this because they find out that a lot of the EC member states don't want it, and India is not interested either anyway. So drop that. And so the solution that's um, being uh, retained on the, the British side is to try to negotiate uh, a special package, but not just for India, but also for Ceylon and, uh, and, and Pakistan. Uh, so, a special package. Uh, and so, in the end, what is this special package? That's probably what the, the most important thing. Um, well, there is uh, a provision for uh, negotiating a comprehensive trade uh, agreement with the Indian subcontinent, and also to gradually introduce the common external tariff on British imports from India, Pakistan, uh, and Ceylon. So with this, the British are very happy to negotiate with the Commission. Comes the Commonwealth Conference, and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> because uh, not only the Indians, but also many other countries say, well, no, this is not to our advantage. Uh, and so uh, India basically says, well, that's all very nice. Uh, we like the idea of the Comprehensive Trade Agreement. That's nice, but we want to open the uh, negotiations right upon British entry into the EC. And that's not what we propose in the package, they say 1966, you know, much later. Uh, and also, quite frankly, uh, some Indian officials think that the common external tariff should not be applied to Indian goods anyway. So the, the, the British are very disappointed to find this, you know, they didn't think that this would happen, they thought that this was a, a great deal, but disappointment. Uh, all of this, uh, unfortunately, comes to an end when uh, General uh, de Gaulle says no to British entry. So that's the end, you know, in uh, January 1963. And that, what India does is to try to save what the British had negotiated for them. So for the next years, and it takes a long time, but of course I won't go into all, all the details here, 
uh, there are several demarches by uh, Indian officials to try uh, to, to save uh, what uh, had been obtained during the negotiations. Also, uh, the, um, the uh, president of the European Commission, Walter Hallstein, goes to India to say that the DEC is great, there's nothing to fear, and so on and so on. He's a professor, so he gives this incredibly long lectures. I could imagine people, you know, falling asleep in the, in the, in the room, just listening to him. Um, and then, uh, right after he gives this long defense of how good the EC is, uh, um, a future prime minister, uh, Manmohan Singh, publishes an article, so it's 1963, on India and the European Common Market in the Journal of Common Market Studies. Now that's a journal, I mean, in the same edition, Jean Monnet also publishes, uh, you know, uh, explaining what his method is for, you know, uh, international relations, for uh, you know, introducing peace in international uh, relations. And what Singh says is that, uh, yes, uh, sure, Western Europe is going to grow faster, and that could be good for developing countries, but it maybe won't necessarily be so, because um, the consumption patterns in developed countries uh, and the development of synthetic substitutes would not necessarily favor imports from developing uh, countries. And he also says it's all very nice. You're giving us all this uh, assistance, you know, that's very, very nice. However, the stringent uh, uh, import restrictions that you import on some of our most uh, um, important export co um, commodities almost nullify the aid that you send us. So this is not right. And what we need to do is to develop uh, our export and manufactured products. And then he goes on to list all the products, you know, the problems with the, uh, with the uh, EC. Um, and uh, his then article is almost echoed by an air mémoire by the Indian mission to, to the EC, which again details you know, the, the, the problems and, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, ask again for the negotiation of a bilateral agreement. So now uh, the, the Sikhs did not agree at that time to uh, a bilateral uh, agreement with, uh, with, uh, with India. So the question uh, is uh, why this didn't happen? Um, well, I would say that there, there are several reasons to that. First of all, DC is still evolving. It's still uh, creating some of its policies. So it's not ready to negotiate, perhaps, this big, uh, this big agreement. Uh, second, also, there are divisions uh, within the European Commission itself on what one should do. So there's one uh, view that says that uh, you shouldn't have a bilateral agreement now. Just with India, you need to broaden this and to have uh, an agreement with other countries uh, uh, as, as well. Um, and uh, within the member states, and that's the, uh, the view that wins in the end, there is this uh, view that uh, a unilateral solution is better where the EC will simply say, okay, this is what we give you in a number of products, and that's it. And India will not then be able to use a bilateral agreement with the Joint Commission and so on to ask for more. So that's the end of the story. And that's the story that's, that's retained. And so you have to wait uh, until the, because I have to, to stop at some point as well, so there are various crises during the 60s and so on, which uh, I skip uh, all kinds of problems with jute and choir and, and, and so on and so on. And then um, there is a second British application as well. And then we come to the, the application that succeeds this time in the, in the, in the 70s. And it seems that um, these whole negotiations, you know, the first negotiations were a general rehearsal for what actually happened then. So much so that actually some of the same people are there. So Ambassador Lal Kamp is there again. Some of his good friends in the European Commission uh, are also there. Uh, and they unearth, you know, so, so what they, they really wanted uh, back then. Um, so in the end, what they do get, because I have to stop, is uh, a cooperation agreement. They do get that, but after incredibly, incredibly uh, long negotiations, uh, and I'll just give you a few, uh, few examples here of the frustration of Indian officials. So the Indian officials work a lot with the British, who push, you know, for uh, the agreement uh, behind the scenes. Uh, and they're increasingly, they're more and more in the community because, uh, you know, when they have signed the treaties uh, of, of accession, even before the ratification, they already participate in the meetings with the Council of Ministers and so on and say, yes, you should definitely give this to India, they need this cooperation uh, agreement. So here's uh, some um, uh, 
examples of the frustrations on the, on the, the Indian side. So um, the Indian official uh, told the British that after two or three years of contacts, they found DC to be vast and immobile. Uh, discussions on truth had uh, yielded an offer of an absurdly low quota, while not much progress had been made on a commercial agreement and the establishment of a joint commission. DC was so slow in its discussions and in, with India that it would put a snail to shame. So you see, and then the British said, no, actually, they're not so slow. Actually, they, they can move very fast indeed when the circumstances are right. And you can see that DC is almost a, a the British are almost a, a member at, uh, at that stage. And uh, so what you um, end up having is uh, a series of agreements, and that, that's, what's, that's the beauty of it. So you have the first agreement, the, the commercial cooperation agreement, that signed finally, it takes 10 years almost, I can believe, so almost 10 years for this agreement to finally, you know, uh, um, you know uh, to finally be negotiated to enter a, into force. And um, I guess that what the Commission and India did is to uh, negotiate uh, an evolutionary document, um, whereby you know, there is within the, the, these agreements a joint commission. And the commission, so it's with Indian officials, you know, and uh, also EC officials who both the commission and, and the member states. And this commission progressively did more and more in a way. And so what you see in the first agreement is supposed to deal only with trade, right? But in fact, if you read the text of the agreement, you see that actually the language could be interpreted in such a way that it could deal with a little more than that trade. Uh, and so when uh, the frame of the, uh, the first agreement begins to crack, because actually they're dealing with things that are more with trade anyway already, then you negotiate another agreement. So the second agreement that also was development, for instance. And then you negotiate a third agreement, you see? And it seems, and I will close with that, that uh, India was, in a way, applying the same method that, what the, that the community was applying, this step-by-step -step approach, this engrenage. It's exactly what happened. So Lal, who basically was at the, the root of this idea, uh, had this brilliant idea, in a way, that you would, you know, I guess, uh, put the EC in such a frame that it would force the EC to go and, and give more, you know, I guess, uh, concessions to, to India. Not concessions, because actually it was not thought of as concessions. It was thought of as a partnership between equal partners as well. Uh, and so I think that's the beauty of these agreements, is to entrap the EC, then the EU, into uh, getting, uh, you know, giving more and more to India. And uh, so, for instance, going beyond trade to uh, industrial cooperation, investment, uh, more development cooperation, cooperation uh, in science and technology, and so on. To this day, where we have now a strategic partnership and we are negotiating a, a, you know, a free trade area as well. So that's, that's what happened, I think. Anyway, I will close this. I've been too long, but as you can see, I am still uh, you know, thinking of what it is that I found in all these documents that, uh, that I've read. So thank you very much for your patience.